Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. All right. Well, hey, good morning. morning. Yeah, that's right. We're excited, uh, but we're tired, okay? So... That's right. Adults, listen, if you are a parent of one of these teens, just realize tomorrow you have another day off because they're going to sleep all day long. Okay? That's right. And maybe even all this afternoon. Um, My name is Seth Tucker. Uh, I've been a youth pastor for a long time, and now I kind of encourage and equip youth pastors across the state of Arkansas. But uh, what, what, what is awesome is we got to start today in worship, and we got to start today with a baptism. And baptism... That's right. Amen. Baptism should be like the biggest party that we have in a church. I'm just saying. Listen, one thing that I know, adults, is this. Teenagers, and actually all people, all people, they replicate what we celebrate. Okay? And so if we celebrate spiritual things, people are driven towards spiritual things. If we celebrate physical things of this world, then we will then we will continue on the things that are physical and of this world. So let's be people that celebrate the people that are unashamed to get in a baptistry and to say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And so that was awesome. I'm so proud of you, all right? Um, as we looked at unashamed this weekend, what we talked about was 1 Peter 4, 16 was kind of the theme verse for us, and we built around that. And 1 Peter 4, 16 says this, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And it's this idea of suffering that we kind of looked at, right? Because uh, we first looked at the life of Peter, the author of the book of 1 Peter, the one who penned this. And as Peter denied Christ three times. But then later, he's bold in facing death, and he, and he preaches, and 5,000 people come to know Jesus, And how did he get to that point? It's purely just the incredible grace of God. Nothing that he did or or could have done. Just the grace of God that brought a person from denying Christ to proclaiming his name. And then for, for the rest of the time, we looked at who we are as Christians. Who is, what is our identity out of 1 Peter chapter 2? What is our identity and how has that led us to be unashamed uh, as, as children of God, to worship God, to proclaim the name of God, to pray for lost souls to be saved? And that was kind of our walk that we've had so far. But in all of it, what I want you all to understand is that the book of 1 Peter was written to some Christians that were facing persecution. They were being put to death. They were being ostracized from their community. Why? They were being treated that way because they were followers of Jesus Christ. Now, we all can't say that that's where we're at in our life, right? Like, we haven't been ostracized or, put, or faced death for our faith right now. But what we can say is we have suffered. We all face suffering, right? Um, I want to show you a picture of my family real quick, if we could. I don't know. I didn't prep you guys too quickly for that. If we can't, that's okay. But um, I've got four kids. There we go. My wife, Melody, we've been married 10 years. My oldest son right there, his name's Judah. My, uh, he's, he's about to turn eight. I've got a five-year-old daughter there named Mercy. I've got a three-year-old son in my arm named Gideon, and then a one-year-old son named Phineas, okay? And, and my children, uh, their names all come from Scripture, even Phineas. It's not just a cartoon, okay? Um, but, but I want to tell you, there was a point at which my wife and I, between Judah and Mercy, uh, we had another pregnancy. 
and, and we lost a child. And I had never really understood suffering until that happened in my life. And uh, it wasn't something that someone had done to us. It wasn't something that, that God was punishing us. It was truthfully something that happens because we live in a fallen world. And, and in that moment, though, I was put in the crucible. I was either going to question the love and, and the, the goodness of my God, or I was going to pursue him deeper. And we took a couple days to think about that. I'll be honest. Then my wife and I decided that we would fast for a time. And we fasted together, not, not for, for some reason of, of necessarily for prayer, but for this reason. To intensify the pain that we were going through. Because sometimes God, or actually, listen, we, we try to avoid persecution. We try to avoid pain. We try to avoid trials. But let me tell you something. What, what, what we see biblically is we need to allow that trial or that pain or that persecution to drive us to need Jesus. It's not about us getting away from it or escaping, right? Why, do, why is television so popular? Because we can escape reality. Why do, we, why, is, why do people use drugs to get away from their life? You know, what we need to realize is pain was never meant to be avoided. Pain was meant to drive us to need Jesus. And in that moment of our pain, we had a choice to make if we were going to be ashamed of our God or if we were going to follow him deeper. And that's what, what we see as we look through this passage. You can take the picture down. They'll only look at my kids, okay? Um, <laughs> sorry. As we jump in, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5. And what I want us to look at is this idea that, that in, in, in trials and struggles, we're going to have choices to make. Are we, going to, are we going to be unashamed or are we going to pursue God? Because it really is in those struggles and trials of life. It's in those trials that, that our faith is tested. That us being unashamed, though, would also be a point that would be noticed by the world in our struggles. Because we, we talked about last night for a second that when we struggle, we struggle for a purpose. So that others will come to know Jesus Christ. And so jump in with me and we will read verses 8 and 9 of 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5 verses 8 and 9. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So what we see here is, is, is this right here. Firstly, and form, uh, for, firstly, I want us to talk about our first point. We face God-sized challenges in life. Things that we can't handle on our own, but our God can. And, and we also see in verse 8 that we have an enemy. Okay? There is an adversary or an enemy that all Christians have. Now, we in America, we have a hard time sometimes. Sometimes it's very easy. We have a hard time seeing him. Okay, because he doesn't act the same way here for the most part as he does in, in third world countries and things like that. But let me tell you what, our enemy here is the same enemy there. And he has the same goal here as he does there. We may not see as many people possessed by, by demons and things like that. But let me tell you what we do see. We see the enemy who wants to destroy lives. He wants to take Christians and he wants to cripple them to where they're ineffective and, and they're ashamed of the gospel. And how does he do that? He puts you into a God-sized struggle. And God allows it. He does. Why does he allow it? Because he wants you to come to him because it's a him-sized struggle. And it's in that moment where we could easily walk away and be ashamed but we have this enemy and he is powerful and we need God. And it says in verse eight, to be sober minded, to be watchful. What does that mean? It means we need to be ready. We need to be prepared for these times. Can I share something, a little secret to you all? If you wait for darkness to come, you will not be ready for it. 
Preparation for the darkness comes in the light. That means we have to prepare our hearts and our minds for the enemy's attacks. We need to be ready with the gospel. We need to be ready with assurance of our faith. And so how do we resist him? Verse 9. Verse 9 says this. It says, resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. It says to resist him firm in your faith. Teenagers, we've talked a lot about the gospel of Jesus Christ this weekend because that is alone what drives us in our life to be unashamed, okay? But hear me now. When the enemy who is real attacks, how do we resist him? We resist him by being firm in our faith. And you're like, what does that mean, Seth? Let me tell you all what being firm in your faith means. It means first and foremost, knowing that you have eternal life. It means if you are not confident in the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive your sins and that you've trusted in that and found salvation, you need to settle that and come to a place of, of just being totally assured of it. Why is that? Because when the enemy attacks, it'll be real quick, real easy for you to doubt and walk away. Real easy. We need to be firm in our faith. That's why we hope and pray that everyone in this room, but you teenagers this weekend, one of our goals is we want you to be firm in your faith. If you've been counting on anything other than the blood of Jesus Christ and him dying to forgive your sin for your salvation, we wanted you to meet Jesus this weekend. And we still want you to meet Jesus whenever you're, you come to that point. This morning, you'll have another opportunity to sit down and say, to come and talk to some adults and say, hey, I need to become firm in my faith by knowing that I have eternal life. We also resist him uh, we also resist him by being confident in our God. By being confident in our walk with him. If you're not growing in your faith, then, then honestly you're not going to be ready for the enemy's attacks. <clears throat> There's a, a Texan that I got to know a little bit. I'm from Arkansas, by the way. All right, I got to know a Texan by the name of John Randalls for a while. And John Randalls was a, a preacher. He worked with sports teams all across Texas and, all other, and many other states. And I brought him in to do some events for me in, 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 in my past. And, and John is one of those guys that has sayings that just stick. You know what I mean? And so I asked John, and by the way, he passed away probably about a year and a half ago, maybe two years. I can't remember, but it's been a, it might have been much longer than that. But he was just a good man, uh, a godly man who, who served the church well. And, and he had one saying that always stuck with me. He said this, there's three things you can't kind of be. You can't kind of be dead, right? Unless it's, you know, uh, oh, oh, the Princess Bride movie, right? Then he was, was kind of dead. Mostly dead. No, you can't kind of be dead. You can't kind of be pregnant, Right? I've had a teenager come to me and so she said, I, I'm kind of pregnant. I said, no, no, you're pregnant. <laughs> and thirdly, you can't kind of be a Christian. That's right, amen. You either are a believer in Jesus Christ and you've put your faith in him, wholly surrendering to the gospel, or you haven't. And so we want you to be prepared for the enemy's attacks, teenagers, to be unashamed because you are standing firm in the knowledge that you are a child of God. So the first point was God-sized challenges. And in those, to stand firm in our faith. Uh, does anybody like putting Christmas lights on their house? Like, a few of y'all? Not very many. Okay. It might be a little rural where nobody would see your house, so I understand not putting them on your house. Okay? But let me just, if you live in a neighborhood, there's no excuse. Okay? <laughs> I love putting Christmas lights on, your on my house. And let me tell you something about it. When I put Christmas lights on my house, I do it the way God intended. Okay? Here's how. The Saturday after Thanksgiving, I get on my roof. Right? I start putting Christmas lights up. Also, the right, the right way is this. Every Christmas light has a clip. Why? Because they all should point up to Jesus. Okay? Every light has a clip. 
And then let me go a step further. I use those soft white lights, the old school ones, because that's what we should do. Let me tell you what, LED Christmas lights, green lights, red lights, blue lights, those are for children, okay? <laughs> All right, now that we've established that. This, not this past Thanksgiving, but the one before. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm ready, I'm sold out, I'm getting on my roof, but it was cold, right? I usually like, it's warm. It's cold, and so I get on my roof, and I'm up there, and it's like 11 o'clock at night. By the way, I do it from 9 to like midnight or 1, because then I don't miss time with my kids, you know, from 5 to 9. And so I, I get on my roof, 11 o'clock hits, and like the frost hit my roof. Yeah, normally I put my ladder in this little crevice to where I can safely walk down the ravine of my roof, but this time I didn't do it. I put it on the side that's flat with no crevice or anything. It's just straight down to my ladder. My, my roof's not huge, but it's like 30 feet up, maybe a little higher. And then the, from the eave to the ground is 15 feet. And I'm up on my roof. The, the frost hits. I start skating on those shingles, okay? It's slick. And I, I get to this point where, where I'm like, man, I, I need to get off my roof. And I look at from my ladder, and it's not where I usually put it. It's over on the side. And I think to myself, wow, that's going to be dangerous. And then I say, I should probably call my wife and wake her up and have her move the ladder for me, right? And then I say my favorite three words that always get me in trouble. I got this. You know what I mean? So, so what did I do? I got scientific on it, you know? I thought to myself, hey, surface area equals friction, so I spread out, laid on my back, and I, I started scooting, you know? I'm scooting, but scooting after three feet turns to sliding. And I think at that point, as I'm sliding down my roof towards my ladder, I think, I hope I don't break my legs. My feet hit my ladder. Ladder shoots away. My leg, thankfully, doesn't get caught in it. And I dropped 15 feet to the ground on my back. Whew. But you know what? It's in moments like that when, when like I'm on my roof and I say, I got this. And I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have had that, you know. <laughs> that we see our second point, right? In moments of trial, when we are being tested and we are in the crucible, our first point, we have these God-sized challenges. But the second is this. We need to trust God in his plan. See, verse 6 says this, as we're going to Quentin Tarantino back to 6 and 7, okay? It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that, the, that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So the first little phrase there is, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. See, in these moments of trial, what is our first reaction? Our first reaction is to do better. Our first reaction is to put our boots on and to work harder, right? That's the American way. Our first reaction to trials and struggles and persecution is to say this, I got it. It really is, is it not? I can handle this. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to do better. But let me tell you, that is not the Christian way. That, that idea is not what Christians are called to do. Christians are to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, meaning this, we are to realize there are some situations in life we can't handle on our own. We have to turn to our God and say, God, I need you to do this for me. God calls us to be humble. Really, if you think about it, for someone to be ashamed of our God is to not be humble. It's very prideful, right? It's to say that, that what is going to happen to me is, is far greater than the kingdom of God. To be unashamed is humility. It's to say, hey, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this but I trust my God. That's right, amen. Yes. I trust his plan. Yes. 
This, this term, though, mighty hand of God, is something that I've grown to love, okay? To trust, to humble ourselves where? Under the mighty hand of God. So what is the mighty hand of God? Well, it's all through Scripture. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. It's there. And what it means is this. The mighty hand of God is not his hand of, 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 like, uh, of, of punishment. It's not his hand of wrath. It is this. The mighty hand of God is God's redemptive work and plan throughout all of time. It's God's mighty works that he has done to save his children throughout all of time. That is the mighty hand of God. Does anyone here like roller coasters? Yeah, right? Yeah, woo! You all are crazy. Okay? Can't stand roller coasters. I, here's, here's my reaction to a roller coaster. I'll get off that roller coaster, and within two minutes, I'm losing my lunch. Right? And then I have a headache the rest of the day. But let me tell you something. When I was in ninth grade, I lived a ninth grade boy's dream. I went to a theme park called Silver Dollar City up in Branson, Missouri, with my ninth grade school choir on a field trip. No educational purpose. We didn't sing or nothing, right? I go on this field trip, and why was I even in choir? Okay, I can't sing. They actually asked me not to come back to choir in 10th grade. For real. So why was I in choir? Because it was me, eight dudes, and like 70 girls. Listen, guys, choir. Just saying. Check it out, okay? So I'm on this trip with all these girls, and we go into Silver Dollar City. We're, we're, we're going to be, like, having fun, and it's going to be crazy. And I know what happens to me on roller coasters. I know exactly what's going to happen. And so we walk into Silver Dollar City. We're running around. These two in particular girls that, that, uh, that, that I was kind of fond of, and they were kind of fond of me, uh, we go through the park. And they're like, Seth. You've got to ride wildfire with us, which is this roller coaster that starts up here, goes down, comes up, flips upside down, twists sideways. It's crazy. And I'm like, listen, I'm not going to ride with you. It's a bad idea. Nobody wants that. I said, but I'll wait in line with you, and then I'll jump across the tracks, and I'll wait for you at the end, right? Pull that, pull that card, you know? And so we get in line. But every like five minutes of like a 30 minute wait, they're like, Seth, you gotta ride this with us. You gotta ride this roller coaster. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to, I can't. You don't want that, nobody does. We get to the front of the line though, and they say, Seth, you gotta ride this ride with us. And I'm getting ready to, you know, no, can't do it. And they did what they never should have done, they grabbed my hands. <laughs> Listen, if we wanna win another war, we give ninth grade boys rifles in one hand and a ninth grade girl holding their other one, and they're going to be invincible. You know what I mean? So I, they grab my hands. I'm riding this roller coaster. This is going to be awesome. So I get on that roller coaster. It goes up, goes down, it goes all around. I'm like holding their hands. I'm like, this is the best roller coaster ride of my life. I get off that roller coaster. I walk about 30 feet to the ledge and I lose my lunch. I have a headache the rest of the day. Now don't feel bad for me because those two girls pampered me the rest of the day. And who doesn't love to be pampered, you know? <laughs> it's quote Andy Griffith, I was sick as a dog having the time of my life. <laughs> so I get off that roller coaster and what happens? The very thing that always has happened. But here's the point. In moments that are extremely high, like, man, I'm going on this roller coaster. And in moments that are extremely low, like, man, we just lost a child, or I'm facing depression, or we've got $12 in our bank account, or I lost a friend because I became a believer in Jesus Christ, or my parents are getting a divorce. In moments that are high and moments that are low, let me tell you what happens. We forget the past. We forget history. And so what we humble ourselves under is the mighty hand of God, but we need to remember what the mighty hand of God is. The mighty hand of God is Abraham being led out of his father's land by the mighty hand of God. The mighty hand of God stopped Abraham's hand from slaying his son Isaac. 
The mighty hand of God led Israel out of slavery. The mighty hand of God calmed the storms and saved his disciples. The mighty hand of God grabbed Peter and pulled him out of the water when he took his eyes off Jesus. The mighty hand of God sent Jesus Christ the Son to live the life that you could never live, to die the death that you deserve so that you could be saved. The mighty hand of God has worked at times in your lives. There have been times in my life when I had no idea what to do. It was a God-sized challenge, and God provided. That was his mighty hand. The preparation for dark days comes in the light. We need to constantly think about and meditate on what God has done so that when the dark days come, we can say, I'm ready. I can trust my God, and I can trust his plan. And then verse 7 says to cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Let me tell you what. Our God doesn't just say, hey, cast your cares on me. He says this. He says, I love you. I love you too much to let you go through this alone. And I want you to give all of your struggles, all of your anxieties, all of your fears, I want you to give them to me. And I'll, I'll take them. The one thing that we might miss if, if we didn't talk about was this. To cast your anxieties on him is actually fully dependent on if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. See, you can't cast your anxieties on God if you do not humble yourself under his mighty hand. If you don't trust God and trust his plan, then you will continue to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. If you say, hey, I've got the weight of the world on my shoulders, it's because you do. You're trying to carry a burden that was never meant for you. You've got to humble yourself. Those who are unashamed are only unashamed because of humility. We've got to humble ourselves under his mighty hand. Let me tell you, the gospel of Jesus Christ and for someone to become a Christian requires humbling yourself. If you think about it, right? What, when we notice that we are sinful people who, who face an eternity in hell, what is humanity's first reaction to realizing that they don't line up with God? Well, I'm going to do better. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to start going to church. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey these laws. Or I'm going to be nicer to people. That is humanity's first response. But it's the wrong response. Because that's, I got this. The gospel is humbling ourselves and saying, God, I, I can't handle my sin. There's nothing that I can do. The gospel is saying, I need Jesus Christ and his blood that was shed on the cross to forgive me. I told this teenagers all, all weekend, and I'll tell everybody in the room again. Every time that we're in the word of God, we all have a response to make. Myself included, Pastor Edward, everybody. There's a response when we are in the word of God. If you're reading it at home or if you're being preached to on a Sunday, there's a response. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your savior and you've never said, God, I can't handle my sin, but I know that you can. If you've never been saved, become a Christian, let me tell you what, that's your response until you make it. Then I'd say, hey, if you've trusted in Jesus but you've never been baptized, be unashamed and step into the baptistry and say, hey, I'm with Jesus and he's with me. For many of us, though, we're going through God-sized challenges that we've been trying to take care of. And I'm not telling you, like, if you've if you're low on funds in your account, stop working. That's not what I'm saying, okay? But what I am saying is stop thinking you can do it all by yourself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Trust him and his plan. And when you do that, you are living the unashamed life because it's him that's living through you and not yourself. So what I'd ask is this, I want, to, I want the band to come up here and I, I want the elders and the prayer team to come on down if you would. 
And we're going to have an opportunity to respond. Because it's one thing to say that we all have a response, and it's another thing for us to give you a chance to respond. I've come to understand that for the most part, if I don't give someone a chance to respond, they don't. And so what we need to do is this. I want you all to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to just ask the God of the universe to tell you what your response is. If you need to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that's your response. If you need to be saved today, then that's your response. If you need to come forward to, to be baptized, that's your response. For many of us though, you know what our response is? We get to worship the God who laid down his life for our sin. We get to worship in another song, the, the God that, that we can trust in the midst of our trials. And I can't emphasize this enough, students, especially, listen, when these trials come, you need to be firm in your faith. If you're sitting there and you're not like, listen, I need to talk to someone about whether, whether I'm a believer or not, because I really don't understand it all. I don't understand what it means to be a Christian. I want you to talk to them. And then I'd also say there's another amazing, beautiful response of worship. And that's to take communion together. If you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, there are tables of, for communion at the, on my right and my left and in the back of the room. If you wanna take communion as a family, it's an act of worship to remember what Jesus Christ has done. So however God leads you to respond, just pray right now, God, tell me how to respond. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is powerful and mighty. I thank you that we can trust you in the moments of, of trial and that through humility we can be unashamed as it is not for our sake that we live but for yours. God, I pray that you would speak to individual hearts communicating to us our response and that you would give us the boldness to respond. We praise you because you are good and mighty and you always care for your children. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.